was born in 51, so I lived in Brooklyn during the 50s, which was a little bit like living in a Woody Allen movie. Uh, I lived in a, a neighborhood, an area called Canarsie, which was actually named after the Canarsie Indians. You know, but when I was about eight, I got interested in reading. Uh, in grammar school, I went to Catholic grammar school, and uh, they had a little book club you know, where you could get books every month. And so I would start to pick out some books. Really, eight years old, I discovered Edgar Allan Poe, and uh, who was not a major uh, influence on me. But um, I also started watching a lot of television. And although I missed uh, shows like 77 Sunset Strip and Hawaiian Eye and Maverick and all those first run, I watched them all in reruns. I got really interested in both uh, mysteries and westerns because of that, because of the, the, the two shows. And really the Warner Brothers shows, really, the stuff that got me turned on to watching all kinds of detective stuff. So that when stuff came on like The Man from Uncle and The Wild Wild West and all of that in the early 60s, I was right there with all that stuff. Uh, I was a musician when I was younger, so I playing the guitar when I was eight. And uh, when I got interested in reading, so I had to balance my time between reading and, and practicing the guitar. And uh, when I was 12, I think I discovered um, Mickey Spillane. Still not a major influence. Um, my major influence as far as writing goes uh, didn't happen until I was 15 and I went to the movies and saw Paul Newman in Harper, which was based on a Ross McDonald novel. And uh, I was hooked on The Private Eye at that point uh, and went out and bought the book that the movie was based on and started reading private eye fiction heavily at that time. Uh, also, uh, at 15 is when I started to write. I started writing a, a Hardy Boys book, stealing characters from the Hardy Boys. And that didn't pan out. I started writing a Mission Impossible book and that didn't pan out very well. And then I wrote a Man From U.N.C.L.E. book where I combined uh, the Man From U.N.C.L.E. characters with the Girl From U.N.C.L.E. characters. And that was in a closet in my house for years. I don't know where it is now. I think my brother has it. He says he's never going to give it back to me. He says it should be worth money someday. So uh, I really was interested in, you know, uh, Wyatt Earp and Wagon Train and, and Maverick and all that stuff. But I never really thought about writing westerns. It was always mysteries. Um, when I was 15, I decided that I wanted to write for a living when I turned 30. So I just started writing after school. It was like I stopped going out to play and I'd come home from school and I would just write. And I'd be writing privatized stuff most of the time. And when I was 18 I started submitting stories to Ellery Queen magazine and Alfred Hitchcock magazine and stuff like that. Really wanted to be published at 18. Didn't happen. I uh, sold my first story when I was 22 to a mystery magazine. And uh, sold a bunch of stories in the mystery field and joined Mystery Writers of America so I could meet other mystery writers. Still just watching westerns on TV and in movies, you know, watching old movies. Uh, this is about the time now we get to the Big Valley and uh, the, the sort of the last days of Bonanza and Gunsmoke and, and stuff like that. Still not thinking about writing westerns. Uh, just really wanting to, to be Mickey Spillane or Ross McDonald or one of those private eye guys, you know. But uh, when I joined the Mystery Writers of America, I met my first editor. His name was Michael Seidman. And uh, I was painfully shy, 22-year-old, when I joined the Mystery Writers of America. So I decided the only way I was going to meet people, they have a cocktail party once a month, the only way I was going to meet people was the 10 bar. So I got behind the bar at every bank, at every uh, cocktail party, and that's where I met people. And I met him, and uh, started giving him drinks for free, and uh, cultivated a friendship with him. And he ended up buying my first book, which was a mystery. It came out in 1980. We thought we were going to continue that mystery series. It was a private eye. I finally got to write a private eye novel. And he called me up one day and he said, uh, "Can you write western?" And really, at that point, I don't think I'd even read one. Just watched it on TV and in the movies. And I said, sure. He said, we, we really want to get into this adult western 
crazy, you know. And we'd like you to come up with an idea for a series. So I went out to a used bookstore and I bought about 40 used westerns. Pretty much one in every series that I could find so that I wouldn't repeat anybody's series. And I think that's when I found the Sackett books by Louis L'Amour, right? because I was looking for series to read. And I found a Tell Sackett book and I really, I really enjoyed that. So I read those. I continued to read those books even after that. But I came up with the concept for The Gunsmith. And I did a proposal and uh, I gave it to Seidman and he said, okay, we want to do this. We'll give you a two book contract to do two gunsmiths. And I said, okay, fine. And uh, I was working for the police department at the time. And uh, I was working midnights, so I would, I would go in and do whatever work I had to do at the beginning of my shift, and then I would use their typewriter and their paper and I would write. And a little while later, Michael called me and he said, uh, we want to give you a contract for a third one, because we really want to get into this heavy. So we'll, we'll give you, we'll give you, we gave you a two-book contract, we'll give you a contract for the third book. I said, okay, fine. And I start writing the first book, and then I hear from him and he says, um, can you do one a month? I, I didn't know if I could write a book a month. I said, sure I can, you know, because in those days I never said no to anything. And he said, okay, we're going to give you another nine book contract, that'll take you to twelve. We're going to do one a month. I said, okay, fine. So I wrote the first one, and I gave it to him. And he read it. And he said, this is pretty good, but we're going to have to break you of this hard-boiled style that you have from writing mysteries. And I said, well, in the Western, it's not hard-boiled. It's hard case. And the gunsman took off from there. I mean, um, I negotiated the contracts for the first 12 myself. I sold my first mystery myself to him. Um, and I decided, uh, a friend of mine named Jonathan Valen, who, uh, was a private eye writer, wrote me a letter and said he read my first mystery. He said, I think my agent might like to handle you. Why don't you give him a call? He's in Manhattan. Give him a call. It was Dominic Gable. So I called him and made an appointment to go see him. And I took the subway into Manhattan and came up out of the subway. And he lived on West End Avenue between, uh, I think it was 81st and 82nd. 82nd had another name on, on the uh, signpost. It said Edgar Allan Post Street. And I took that as a sign. And I went up to his office, 12th store, 12th uh, story penthouse in Manhattan. Another thing that was like out of a movie, you know. And told him that I had the 12 book gunsmith contracts and I had sold my first Western. And I was writing Nick Carter books for charter books at the time, too. They had the Nick Carter series, which was uh, work for hire. You know, flat fee, no royalty. And you wrote about this super spy named Nick Carter. And I brought him a proposal for a private eye series. And I gave him all the stuff, and he said, well, in his clipped British accent, I'll, I'll contact you and let you know if I want to handle you. And the next day he called me and said, I really would like to handle you. He said, but... From this point on, you're going to have to stop selling. You have to write, and, I, and I'll do the selling. And I said, okay. And two weeks later, he sold that new private eye series that I had given him. But over the years, I was never able to stop selling, because I lived in New York. I would call editors and have lunch with them and sell books, and then tell them to contact him, and they would discuss money. So I've sold a lot of the books that I've written myself. So, 1982... You know, it was 12 gunsmiths and about three Nick Carters and a private eye novel. And uh, I discovered I, I couldn't work at the police department anymore. I needed to finally quit and write full time. And I was 30. In 1984, in 12 months, I wrote 27 books. I was writing like four different Western series under four different names for four different publishers. Uh, and when I told Dominic, I wanted to do that. He said, publishers don't like that. They like you to think that you're only writing for them. So you're going to have to do each one under a pseudonym. I said, that's fine. I have no problem with that. And, and the 80s was when adult westerns were just exploding. There must have been 40, 50 different series going on. Uh, from 
uh, publishers like Tower, Belmont Tower, all the way up to Bantam and Avon and uh, Berkeley. Well, not Avon, because I did an adult western series for Avon called Tracker. And I did four books for them. I had written uh, two private eye books for them, and then I sold them this series called Tracker, which was a combination of Paladin and uh, Travis McGee from the Mystery Field. A little bit of both. And they printed 150,000 copies of each book. And they sold out. But they published them in four consecutive months. So that by the fifth month they were off the bookshelves. They should have published them every three months. Then they decided they wanted three more. And they didn't publish those for a year and a half. And those 150,000 people that, were re that read the first four were not there anymore for those books. And um, I think it was Walter Mead at the time was running Avon, decided that adult westerns were beneath Avon and they shouldn't be doing that. So they, they stopped. And to this day, Tracker was probably my best-selling, those first four books was probably my best-selling series. And they're only just now being reissued as e-books. Uh, so people can see them again. Those are some of my favorite books, those Tracker books. I did seven of them. Well, when I joined uh, Mystery Writers of America, I was 24. I started meeting writers. You know. uh, at that point, a little bit, Mickey's Flame was a little bit of an influence. Ross McDonald was a major influence. Um, and when I started reading the Lamore books, the Sackett books, that was an influence. But I knew I was going to be writing adult westerns. So I started reading a series called Gun by Jory Sherman. That was a major influence on what I did in the Western field. Because he was writing adult Westerns that were also pretty damn good Westerns, aside from the sex. They used to say in those days the, that an adult Western had to have a flip factor of a sex scene every 10 pages. Well, it's not quite that many, you know. Uh, so I, uh, I was reading Jory's books and I corresponded with him. And so I got to know him through letters, and when I went to my first Western Writers Convention in 82, he was like one of the first people I met. And still was an influence on me, just sitting and talking to him about the business, because he, he went back to Haight-Ashbury in the 50s and the, and the, and the Beat Poets. You know, and he uh, knew all, every, everything that was going on in publishing in New York in the 60s. You know, so he was a, a, a major influence as far as the Westerns went. You know, the other influences on me in Westerns were TV shows, even more than movies. I was a child of TV. I mean, I watched TV incessantly. So Wild Wild West was a big influence. Paladin was a big influence. Uh, old shows like Colt 45 and Black Saddle, who nobody even remembers anymore. And, you know, Wagon Train and, and uh, Bonanza, Gunsmoke, Big Valley. I mean, those were all major influences. The series that only, was only on for like six months, like the Monroes or Shenandoah, you know, or uh, um, The Guns of Will Sonnet, which was on two seasons, you know. Watch those. I mean, it, that was my education as far as Westerns went until I started reading nonfiction. I started reading, you know, Leon Metz and Glenn Shirley and Bob Utley and, and all those books for research, you know. And those were a big influence because while I was researching one idea, five or ten others would pop up, you know. And a major influence on me became Bat Masterson. I really had an affinity for Bat Masterson, started to think that I was reincarnated from Bat Masterson, who was a gambler and who ended up as a writer in New York uh, during the 19 teens, 1911, 1912. He was a sports writer for the Morning Telegraph. He was also a vice president of the newspaper. And he was a sports nut like I was. He was a writer like I was. He was a gambler like I thought I was at the time, you know. Um, and that's why I wrote a Bat Masterson book, the, the, the Hammer Porter, in 85 for Doubleday, you know, where he was in New York solving a mystery. A lot of my westerns cross over into mystery because I, I really enjoy both forms and I like mixing them up. A lot of my gunsmiths are mysteries. When I get stuck for a gunsmith because I've been doing one a year, 
for 32 years, I write a mystery. You know? Or I write a Wild Wild West type story. You know? And I actually refer to Jim West in the Gunsmith books. I don't give many dialogue, so nobody can sue me. But he talks about his friend in the Secret Service, Jim West. You know? So a little nod to Robert Conrad. Well, I started writing the Gunsmith series in 81. Um, the target date to, to bring one out was January 82. Gunsmith number one would come out. And um, I think I probably had eight or nine in the can before they... No, I didn't. I had three or four in the can before they came out. And um, I started writing them in first person for charter books. And... Um, because that, that, that was the way I was writing private eye books at the time. It was first person, and I, I was comfortable with it. And um, the first year, I mean, they started to sell pretty well. Uh, well enough during that period with Adult Western was selling where I went out to sell other series. Because so I thought, okay, now I've got some background. Maybe I can sell some other Adult Western series. And I did. I sold several Adult Western series under different names. Um, and they would run seven books, nine books. 15 books, but the Gunsmith just kept going. When we got to Gunsmith 13, um, Berkeley bought charter books, fired my editor, Michael Seidman, and um, we went in for a meeting with them, my agent and I, and they only had two points. They wanted to give me a raise per book, which we said, okay. And they said, we think these books should be written in third person. And I didn't have a problem with that. So starting with book 14, um, I started writing them in third person. And book 14 was kind of a favorite of mine because it had to do with uh, Bill Hickok being shot. I'll backtrack. Gunsmith 4 was called The Guns of Abilene. It was about Hickok when he was Marshal of Abilene. And I did research and I found out he had three deputies. I only found two names. So I dropped the gunsmith in there as the third deputy. Even though I'm writing adult westerns, I try to put him in real situations with real people in these books. So there actually were three deputies there, there at the time. Um, and so I dropped him in as the third deputy. And we went through the whole rigmarole of Hickok with his eyesight going bad and his feud with Phil Coe and accidentally shooting his own deputy because of his eyes and that kind of thing, and indicated that they were very, very good friends, the two of them, because they were both sort of legends in the West. Um, Gunsmith 5 was called the Dodge City Gang. No, 20 was called the Dodge City Gang. And I did Hickok, uh, Masterson, and um, Till, uh, Tillman, all the guys that were in Dodge City at the time. Uh, Whiter, Neil Brown, people like that. and. Uh, so when I got to 14, I had, uh, I did a book about the effect of Hickok's death on the gunsmith, where he became a drunk. And that was the first book I wrote in, in uh, third person. From that point on, they were all third person. And from that point on, I continued to try and use real characters. Buckskin, Frank Leslie, uh, you know, Bass Reeves, uh, Wes Harden, I mean, anybody I could think of. Have him meet the gunsmith because this is this guy's a legend. He would know everybody. Uh, so we go through the '80s, and I'm writing these gunsmiths, and I'm, I'm and I'm trying to establish myself in the mystery field at the same time. Meanwhile, the gunsmith is paying the bills. Gunsmith '54 is one of my favorites. It was called "When Legends Meet," and it's Hickok hears of somebody who's claiming to be Wild Bill Hickok. Uh, Adams hears Clint Adams, the gunsmith, hears that somebody is impersonating Wild Bill Hickok and goes looking for him and finds him and, and exposes him. You know. um, interesting story about the gunsmith's name. I called him in the first book Tom Seidman. My editor's name was Seidman. S-E-I-D-M-A-N. I called him Tom Seidman, S-I-D-E-M-A-N. And they called me up one morning, and this is when I was still working in the police department, so I'd get home at 7.30 in the morning and go to bed. They call me up at 8.30. We just had an editorial meeting, and we want to change his name. 
said, that's fine. As long as you don't call him Sue, you know, I don't care what his name is. They said, well, we want to call him Adam Steele. I said, that's fine with me, but you better talk to George Gilman, because he already has a 22-book series about a guy named Adam Steele. You know, Gilman did Edge and Steel, the two series. They went, oh, okay, we'll get back to you. So I go back to bed, and they call me like an hour later. Okay, we want, we want the Adams in there. I said, okay, what about Clint? Like Clint Eastwood, Clint Adams. They said, okay, that's good. We'll go with that. And that's how he became Clint Adams. Another, another phone call was, uh, we had two, two gunsmiths in the can, and they said, we want him to have a scar on his face. On the cover, we're going to put a scar on his face. But we need you to write a scene where he gets the scar on his face. So we show people how he got the scar. So on the phone, I wrote a scene with the second gunsmith and dictated it on how he got the scar on his face. And then I hardly ever referred to it at all. But from that point on, on the cover, the first cover was full face. From that point on, it was profile, and he had the scar. You know, I enjoyed, I enjoyed writing Gunsmith. Uh, we get to Gunsmith 100, um, which they bring out with a little bit of fanfare and a little different color cover and change the masthead a little bit. Um, my wife at the time had a party for me at my house for Gunsmith 100. She had a plaque made with the cover, and my new Gunsmith editor was at the party with Gary Goldstein. The first time I met him was at my house. And after that, they got to the point where they not only wanted to do the 12 gunsmiths a year, they wanted me to do one giant. They were doing giant long arms. Berkeley used to publish long arm, gunsmith, uh, Jake Logan, and Lone Star, four adult western series. As the 80s went into the 90s and the adult westerns weren't selling as well and they all started falling by the wayside, those four kept going. And the Trailsmen and NAL, those five series kept going. And to this day, four of them are still going. Lone Star has disappeared. But four of them are still going. And um, I got into the 90s with the gunsmith, and I, I started, to, started to wear on me. And that's when I started thinking, well, I just have to have fun. You know, and if I can keep myself interested, then I'll keep other people interested. So I started writing, you know, spy novels and Western novels and within the, the confines of the, of the Western. You know, Gunsmith 200, I decided to do something special, so I had him meet Jesse James. And I indicated that his horse, who he'd been riding all these years, would had been given to him by Jesse James. We get into the 2000s, uh, you know, 2001, 2002, uh, and I'm 200 Gunsmiths, 300 Gunsmiths. Uh, other series have come and gone. Western series have come and gone, mystery series have come and gone. Gunsmith keeps going. Sales are still good. Uh, the only thing is, somewhere in 2000 they decided that we had sold 5 million copies of the books. Last year I noticed it still says 5 million copies sold. So I got a hold of my editor and I said, this has gotta, there's got to be more than that at this point. This is, it has said 5 million copies on the book now for 15 years. I said, it's got to be seven or eight by this point, you know. She says, oh, well, I'll look into it. I don't hear from her for months. And finally she sends me an email. She says, well, we did the research, and starting with, uh, I think, the June book, starting with that one, it's going to say 15 million copies of print. I said, well, that's what it should say. I mean, you've been saying five million for so long. You're talking about a best-selling Western series. I'm, I'm sure nobody noticed that it kept saying five million, but I noticed. When we got into the, uh, the business of electronic books, Berkeley really took their time. Um, I think it was with Gunsmith 300 or 301 that they decided they were going to start bringing them out as e-books also. At the same time, I got the rights back to the first 300. So I thought, well, this is like a little mini gold mine now. We just find somebody who will bring these out as e-books. You know? And um, we did find a publisher called Speaking Volumes that uh, 
wanted the first 200 and said that they'd bring them out within an 18 month period. And so I, I thought, well, I've got all these other Western series. I've got Tracker, which ran seven books, and Angel Eyes ran nine books, Mountain Jack Pike ran 15 books. I called my, my agent and I said, see if they want to do these too. Let's get these back out there as well. And they took those. So they took 231 books. We decided that the other series, we would bring them out now under my real name, come out from behind the pseudonym, but that the gunsmith would continue to appear as J.R. Roberts, which is an anagram of my name, Robert J. Randisi. In fact, the first book that J.R. Roberts wrote is dedicated to Robert J. Randisi, without whom this book would not have been possible.